The ADN, um, so many acronyms for this afternoon, um, is, the, is the, the longest standing, is the way I would describe it, um, the, the originator um, of the RLUK networks. And by the time I finish speaking, you'll realise that it's the model on which the others have been developed. Um, so clearly it worked. Whoever's brainchild it was uh, got it right. Um, <laughs> Um, when, when, uh, when they set it up. So although it's um, very similar to the other networks, it's also a bit different. Um, the ADN doesn't relate specifically to the, the delivery of a specific strand of, of the current strategy or indeed previous strategies, seeing as it's old. Um, but it, it addresses the themes which run throughout all um, of our UK strategies in terms of focusing on the leadership skills that we need um, to deliver. And there's a really strong focus on succession planning. It provides a really important forum uh, for senior staff to prepare uh, for the next step for library directorship. And there's huge value uh, in the network for its members. It gives us opportunities to explore the professional challenges of the day, to, for personal development and stretch, um, it's no easy ride. There are some really uncomfortable conversations um, and also networking and building valuable relationships with peers. There are also opportunities to contribute to the business of RLUK, to the delivery of strategy, planning activities like this conference um, and representing RLUK on external committees and groups and I'll come back to some of these later. The value is two-way, of course, not just to the members. Um, a couple of examples to illustrate this point. Succession planning is working. Um, in the past year, a lot of people have left the group, um, one way or the other. We'll come back to that later as well. <laughs> oh, that sounded really sinister. Um, <laughs> it will, that statement will become clear later. Um, so we've had lots, lots of members progress to, to director roles. Um, and in terms of, of, of returning on the investment in the group, um, another example of, of us paying back, I guess, is of a, a group of um, ADN members planned last night's reception um, up in the reading room, which I hope lots of you enjoyed as much as I did. So I won't go through the, uh, the, uh, the practicalities two conveners, serve two years, meet blah, 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 lots of support from um, the RLUK uh, office um, and board and exec. In the same way as the DSN, um, sorry, Special Collections Leadership Network, we've got met one member per institution. Given that our organisational structures vary, um, not everybody has got the title of Associate Director um, or Deputy Librarian, but we are all in senior leadership roles with, with the appetite to progress to director level. Um, as I've said, membership is regularly refreshed um, as colleagues move to new jobs, um, change institutions, or sometimes directors will share what is actually a really valued opportunity with different members of their senior teams. And this brings new voices um, and different perspectives to the group, which is really helpful in keeping it fresh. Um, I think something that hasn't necessarily emerged <coughs> yet, which is worth flagging, is that there's some membership um, in uh, overlap in membership between the three networks. Um, and we've seen some <laughs> examples of the benefits of this already, and this is something that we want to build on and do more with. So. For example, two ADN members who were also part of the Special Collections Network um, involve members of the, of the Special Collections Network in a GIST project um, on digital archive collections with really positive results. So it works when we, when we hook up together. Um, and we might want to return to the benefit of um, opportunities of overlapping membership um, when we open up discussion later. Like the other groups, we meet two or three times a year. We also aim for a geographical spread to share the travelling. Uh, the themes and topics of the meetings are decided by the members, not by the board or the exec, um, though of course they're within the context of our UK strategy. Um, and then Christopher and I have the job of turning the idea, these ideas into events. Our events really vary in terms of format and style. 
So uh, we bring in speakers to uh, talk with us about challenges facing the sector or our profession. I was reflecting as I put these notes together that the first ADN meeting I ever went to was in late 2016. Uh, the topic was disruption in higher education. Brexit was on the agenda. Uh, who'd have guessed then we'd still be facing the exactly the same uncertainty that we are, that we are now. Um, we bring in facilitators um, to, to take us through workshops, um, scenario planning, for example, um, we focused on. We bring in keynote speakers, so senior colleagues in libraries uh, or other parts of our universities who will share their experience and perspective on our learning themes. And there's a theme which runs throughout um, of peer support where members share their experiences and challenges. And for this to work, a really high degree of openness and trust is essential. There's absolute confidentiality, a really strong sense of, of community, and very strong mutual support. And that's one of the defining characteristics um, of, of the ADN, and one of the things which is really valued about it. As well as our face-to-face -face meetings, we also um, operate digitally via a listserv. So this is a really useful forum for sharing ideas and getting advice and support. We regularly see questions along the lines of, is anyone else working on X or Y? And, and there usually is, and everyone's always happy to help each other. It strikes me, though, that we should perhaps be looking for new opportunities for digital engagement. A listserv does feel a little bit old hat. Um, include it, with, so both within the ADN and with the other networks and as conveners, for example. Again, something we might want to pick up on. The group doesn't exist in a bubble, though, um, and uh, we are serious about our commitment to contributing to our UK business. So Christopher and I were both on the committee to plan this conference, which we take full credit for. Um, and Christopher is the RL UK rep on the GISC Horizons Group, which has just published a report on emerging technologies and the mental health challenge on campus. Just a couple of examples um, to flesh out some of the recent themes. So, in preparing ourselves for moving into director level roles, uh, we've, we've done lots of different things. So at our last meeting, we were really lucky to have Liz Jolly, Chief Librarian of the British Library, come and share a really motivating account of her leadership journey and uh, advice to members on preparing for a library directorship. We've also had um, a really successful event where we focused on recent and current experience of members taking on interim director roles through a series of very candid presentations from colleagues who were currently acting up or had done so recently with a really lively Q&A and discussion session. Um, and at an event last year, members responded to an invitation to share a current leadership challenge, how they tackled it, what they'd learnt, um, and, and to get supportive questions and feedback from the group. Um, a, a really wide range of topics um, was raised, including taking an inclusive approach to developing strategy, reporting lines of libraries within our universities, uh, mainstreaming open access, and overcoming staff resistance to change. A very different approach that we took um, was um, a theme relating strate to strategic and operational effectiveness, and we had a programme of three linked events on demonstrating and measuring the influence, value and impact of our library services to our institution. This was led by Sharon Markless, a senior lecturer in education at King's and a consultant on library effectiveness. These were different, they were really practical sessions with tangible outputs in the form of impact measures for, for us all to take home. They also included the usual reflection on what we'd learnt and a, a discussion about how to present these concepts um, to our senior leaders and stakeholders beyond our libraries. And this was an example of um, an event which was broadened out to include an additional representative for each member library. For most of us, that was the person who leads on planning. And having said that one of the strengths of the network is that it's small and trusted, some topics do lend themselves to a wider audience. And so members are regularly invited to register more than one delegate. So to con continue with the theme of impact, and just to go back to the question of value, we just wanted to share a couple of testimonials that show the value and the benefits of the ADN. This one 
is from a member who's recently been appointed as director following a period as interim. What strikes me about this is that they'd always really valued being in the ADN, but when the chips were down and they were facing new challenges, the openness and trust and mutual support that I talked about earlier really came into their own and made a significant difference to this person. And similar thoughts are echoed here. The first bullet's interesting to me. It really doesn't matter what our remits are. These don't come up in conversations much. And in all honesty, I couldn't tell you always who in the group leads on research data management or collections or pedagogy. Our conversations are strategic and about leadership. What I would say, though, is that the RLUK context is vital. We all do lots of other leadership development. The key value of the ADN is considering these leadership challenges in the context of libraries and higher education. So relevance really matters. And there's more here about a safe place, support, and being brave. I'm not sure we're always brave enough. Um, it's struck me as we've gone through the last um, couple of days that we might need to be a bit braver about what our development needs are in the future if we're going to deal with what's coming our way. Um, and talking of the future, I'll hand over to Christopher so he can tell you about what's coming up next for the ADN. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon. So, um, as Rachel said, the, the ADN uh, is very much, its programme is very much informed by our membership, um, and we are really, as conveners, co conveners, there to listen to what the needs of, of the group are. And at the last meeting, which was held in Sussex late last year, um, we had a discussion just to start to flesh out the, the pro forthcoming programme over the next 12 to, to 18 months. And partly based on the, the sort of case studies that we discussed, uh, the thing that started to emerge was, as an ADN, we'd invested a lot of our time in thinking about ourselves, uh, aspiring to become library directors, our own leadership development. Um, but it was also important that we, we started to think about the pipeline and about the teams that, uh, that uh, we, we head up and the, the development of, of those teams uh, and the leadership capacity and capability within them. So, um, and that also was combined to some degree with, with discussion around culture and changing culture in these, in the, in these uncertain times. So we are... Um, Planning our next event to be around the theme of empowerment, empowerment particularly of our, our direct, direct reports and our teams, in the hope that uh, this will stimulate thinking about broader cultural change. Um, so the event's going to be held in Manchester next week, and um, we've been uh, working very closely with Jan Wilkinson, who will facilitate that event. As many of you will know, she's director of the, Lead the LIBA Emerging Leaders Programme. Uh, and that proves to be a, a, a very exciting and, and uh, uh, an interesting programme that we've got. I think more generally the, the, the members of the network are interested in, in culture and culture change and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the culture of research libraries and, and uh, what this should look like um, as digital scholarship becomes more uh, pervasive, and I think that's a theme that we're probably going to be picking up in, in the next sessions this afternoon. Perhaps um, where we, str uh, and actually there were some parallels with what, what Judy was saying earlier around uh, teaching uh, and engagement with students, we're, we're very aware that RLUK's focus is around research. Um, but increasingly, particularly those uh, members who come from a university background, uh, the, uh, the theme is very much about research-led teaching and research-led education. Uh, and that's the focus of many of our institutional strategies. So that, that, there's been quite a bit of, of discussion uh, about that among members. So um, not just thinking about students as, as consumers of the outputs of research, but actually as, as students as active researchers themselves, and ultimately, of course, they're part of the pipeline of future digital scholars. So we, would quite, we, we, we are considering um, how we might shape an event uh, around negotiating, negotiating that interface between education and research strategy. 
Um, but as Rachel said, really what we want to do is to consider all this within the framework of, of the RLUK strategy, um, alongside other themes and other topics that, that members might bring to the table. And I think the question is how we bring the two together. And then the next one. Um, so Matt Greenhall, as our exec uh, contact, came to speak to the last meeting, really just to in introduce the implementation plan for uh, the RLUK strategy, which has four key pillars, which you'll see here, engage, deliver, collaborate, and advocate. And much of what RLUK is seeking to achieve is really about influence and advocacy, as well as the tangible projects uh, and actions that you've been hearing about. So soft skills, um, we feel, are perhaps one area where the, the ADN could have a particular value and role to play. How do we develop ourselves as leaders in changing environment, but also those uh, skills of our teams and w achieve wider influence within our organisations? And I think one of the strengths of the ADN is that the, the broad range of roles, Rachel referred to this earlier, the broad range of roles represented within the network, um, representing the totality of what research libraries do. So. Um, just to explore that in a bit more detail, this is another slide from, from Matt's presentation, which you may not be able to, to read towards the back. Um, but it, it gives us an opportunity during the year, uh, with and through the Associate Director Network, uh, and with other networks, to consider tangible actions that we can contribute to in order to help implement the strategy. And here are some themes that we could start to explore collaboratively. One, for example, diversity and inclusion. We heard a lot about that uh, yesterday. Diversity of our workforce, of the communities that we serve, and also of our collections. The second is workforce development, so the diversification of skills uh, and backgrounds. And then the third is leadership at all levels to meet future challenges. And so there was an invitation from Matt for us to, to work as an ADN throughout the year to start to think about how we might contribute to this strategy. So I'm just going to, to close by offering um, some potential ideas for, for collaboration between the different networks, some straw person suggestions, if you like, uh, of where we might become involved. The first is around content, uh, and this could broadly include scholarly communications, research outputs, publications, intellectual property, unique and distinctive collections, both and analogue and digital content, and particularly a rad advocacy around developing institutionally inclusive collection policies. So moving perhaps beyond uh, UDCs. The second is the community of researchers um, who create, use and share content. How do we collaborate as RLUK to really understand what researchers need? We heard about that from, from Tom Hickerson yesterday and of course we had the, the great presentations from the British Library earlier today. Are there things that we could do uh, as networks uh, to continue that work? The environment within which we work, um, uh, as Rachel mentioned, a lot of us are uh, involved in sort of the, the planning um, and resource uh, allocations within our services. So the organisational issues, technical, financial and so on. And how can this be used to enable development and transformation of services? Be it that workforce development and diversity demonstrating value for money, which uh, we, we've already uh, looked at within our own network and impact, including across independent interdependent research and teaching agendas. And finally, the skills we need to be more effective. So particularly leadership skills, advocacy, an example of that might be around open monographs, culture, change of open scholarship within and without our services. What's the level of leadership confidence, for example, and how do we work together to ensure, um, to ensure this? A thought that we were having just before the presentation uh, reflecting on Gwenda's talk this morning um, is something around um, crises, dealing with calamity, dealing with those really si serious situations. Are there experiences we can share across networks? How do we support and develop the next generation of leaders' ability to shape scholarship? 